Start. Doing the thing you love to do is no guarantee that you'll be in the zone every time. <clears throat> Sometimes the mood isn't right, the time is wrong, and the ideas just don't flow. Some people develop their own personal ritual rituals and for getting to the zone. They don't always work. I asked Aaron if he had techniques of his own. He said he doesn't, and he wished that he had. But he does know when to stop pushing. When it's not going well, I put it away and try again tomorrow or the next day. One thing I do is drive around in my car with music on. I try to find some place where I don't have to think about driving too much, like a freeway where you don't have to stop at red light or turn or anything. What I don't do is watch other people's movies or television shows or read their plays for fear that they're going to be very good, and either make me feel worse or simply make me inclined to imitate what they're doing. At its best, the process of writing for Aaron is is completely absorbing. Writing for me is a very physical activity. I'm playing all the parts. I'm getting up and down from my desk. I'm walking around when it's going well. In fact, I'll find that I've been doing laps around my house, way out in front of where I type. In other words, I've been writing without writing. Then I have to go back to where I am on the page and make sure I actually type what I just did. In all likelihood, you've had instances in your life where you've become lost in an experience, the way Aaron Shorkin did. When you finally connected with writing, you began to do something you love, and the rest of the world slips away. Hours pass, and it feels like minutes. During this time, you have been in the zone. Those who have embraced the element find themselves in this place regularly. This is not to suggest that they find every experience of doing the thing they love blissful. But they regularly have optimal experiences while doing these thing things, and they know they will again. Different people find the zone in different ways. For some, it comes through intense physical activity, through phys- physically demanding sports, through risk, competition, and maybe a sense of danger. For others, it may come physically demanding sports, through risk, competition, and maybe a sense of danger. For others, it may Come through activities that seem physically passive, through writing, painting, math, meditation, and other modes of intense contemplation. As I said earlier, we don't only get one element a piece, nor is there only one road for each of us to the zone. We may have different experiences of it in our lives. However, there are some common features to being in that magical place. Are we there yet? One of the strongest signs of being in the zone is a sense of freedom and of authenticity. When we are doing something that we love and are naturally good at, we are much likely to feel centered in our sense, in our true sense of self, to be who we feel we truly are. When we are in our element, we feel we are doing what we are meant to be doing and being who we who we are meant to be. Time also feels very different in the zone when you're connecting this way with your deep interests and natural energy. Time tends to move more quickly, more fluidly. For Eva Lawrence, nine hours can feel like twenty minutes. We know the opposite is true when you have to think. When, when you have to do things to which you don't feel a strong connection. We all have experience where twenty minutes can feel like nine hours. At those time, we're not in the zone. In fact, we're probably zoning out. For me, this time shift, the good one, not the bad one, happens most often when I'm working with people, and especially when I'm giving presentation. When I'm deep in the throes of exploring and presenting ideas with groups, time tends to move more quickly, more fluidly. I can be in a room with ten or twenty people, or several thousand. It's and it's always the same. For the twenty-first, for the first five or ten minutes, I'm feeling for the energy of the room and trying things out to catch the right wave playing there. Those first minutes can feel slow, but then when I do make the connection, I slip into a different gear. When I have the pulse of the room with me, I feel a different energy, and I think they do too, which carries us forward at a different pace and in a different space. When that happens, I can look the clock and see that. And o- that almost an hour has gone by. The other feature common 
Among those familiar with this experience is the movement into a kind of me meta state where ideas come more quickly as if you are tapping a source that makes it significantly easier to achieve your tasks. You develop a facility for the thing you are doing because you, you have un unified your energy with the process and the efforts you are making. So there's a real sense of ideas flowing through you and out of you that you're in some way channeling these things. You're being an instrument of them rather than being obstructed to them or struggling to reach them. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Eric Clapton describes it as being in harmony with time. It's a great feeling. You can see and experience this shift in all sorts of performance in acting, in dance, in musical performances, and in sports. You see that people have subtly entered a different phase. You see them relax, you see them loosen up and become instruments of their own expressions. expression. Grand Prix racer Joe Chen Rin said simply that when he is racing, you ignore everything and just concentrate. You forget about the rest of the world and become part of the car and track. It's a very special feeling. You are completely out of this world and completely into it. There's nothing like it. Avi Aviator Wilbur Wright described it this way. When you know after the first few minutes that the whole mechanism is working perfectly, the sensation is so keenly delightful as to be almost beyond description. More than any anything else, the sensation is one of the perfect Peace mingle with an excitement that strains every nerve to the utmost if you can conceive of such a combination. Superstar athlete Monica Sells says, when I'm, when I'm consistently playing my best tennis, I'm also consistently in the zone. But notes, once you think about being in the zone, you are, immedi you are immediately out of it. Dr. Mihaly Chigzen Mihaly it's pronounced chicks send me high. If you like to try it at home, performs decades of research on the positive aspects of human experience. Joy creative, joy creativity, the process of total involvement with life I can I call flow. And his landmark flow in his landmark workflow, the psychology of optimal experience, Dr. Chik San Mihai, Chik San Mihai writes of a state of mind when consciousness is harmoniously ordered and people want to, to pursue whatever they are doing for its own sake. What Mr. Chik San Mihai calls flow and what many others call being in the zone happens when psychic energy or attention is invested in realistic goals and when skills match the opportunities for action. The pursuit of a goal brings order in awareness because a person must concentrate attention on the task at hand and momen momentarily forget everything else. Dr. Chiksen Mihai speaks of the elements of enjoyment, the the components that comprise an optimal experience. This includes facing a challenge that requires a skill one possesses, complete absorption in an, in an activity, clear goals and feedback, concentration on the task at hand that allows one to forget everything else, the loss of self-consciousness, and the sense that time transformed during the experience. The key element of an optimal experience he says in flow, is that it is an end in itself. Even if initially undertaken for other reasons, the activity that consumes us becomes intrinsically rewarding. This is a crucial point to grasp. Being in the element and especially being in the zone doesn't take energy away from you. It gives it to you. I used to watch politicians fighting election or trying to stay in office and wonder how they kept going. You see them traveling all over the world under constant pressure to perform, making critical decisions with every appearance and living irregular hours in a, con in a constant spotlight of tension. 
I wonder how they didn't fall over from sheer exhaustion. The fact is, though, that they love most of it, or they wouldn't do it. The very thing that would wear me out is fueling them up. Activities we love fill us with energy, even when we are physically exhausted. Activities we don't like can drain us in minutes, even if we approach them at our physical peak of fitness. This is one of the keys to the element, and one of the primary reasons why finding the element is vital for every person. When people place themselves in situation that lead, that lead to that lead, when people place themselves in a situation that I don't know how to. It's really like is that really lead? Ooh. When people place themselves in situations that lead to their being in the zone, that lead. When people place themselves in situations that lead to their being in the zone, they tap into a primal, primal source of energy. They are literally more alive because of it. It is as though being in the zone plugs you into a kind of power pack. For the time you are there, you receive more energy than you expend. Than you expend. Energy drives all of our lives. This isn't a simple matter of our physical energy, we think we have or don't have, but of our mental or psychic energy. Mental energy is not a fixed substance. It rises and falls with our passion and commitment to what we are doing at the time. The key difference is in our attitude and our sense of freshness with an activity. As the song says, "I could have danced all night." Being in your element, having that experience of flow, is empowering because it's a way of unifying our energies. It's a way of feeling deeply connected with our own sense of identity, and it curiously comes about through a sense of relaxing or feeling perfectly natu natural to be to be doing what you're doing. It's a profound sense of being in your skin or connecting to your own internal. Pulse or energy. These peak experiences are associated with psychological changes in the body. There may be a release of endorphins in the brain and of adrenaline through the body. There may be an increase in alpha wave activity and changes in our met metabolic rates and in the patterns of our breathing and heartbeats. The specific nature of these psychological changes. Depends on the shorts of activities that have brought us to the zone, and on what we're doing to keep ourselves there. However, we get there. Being in the zone is a powerful and transformative, and transformative experience. So powerful that it can be addictive, but an addiction that is healthy for you in so many ways. Reaching out. When we connect with our own energy, we're more open to the energy of other people. The more alive we feel, the more we can contribute to the lives of others. Hip hop poet Black Ice learned at a very young age that his words could bring out emotions in himself and others. My mom used to make me write about everything. He told an interviewer, "When I got in trouble, when I was happy, or even when I was scared, I was a giddy little kid." When I started liking little girls, I used to write letters for my friends. Mine were better than the circle. Yes, no, maybe so. I came upon spoken word as an adult. I went to a po poetry spot looking to meet women. It was open mic night, and when this cat messed up, the audience gave him lots of love and support. I was blown away, being the aggressive person that I am. It surprised me to see what I would talk about every day in the barber shop, in spoken word form at the club. I was able to release what was on my chest, and people would understand what I was saying. Black Eyes, born Lamar Manson, moved from those early performances to increasingly bigger stages. He appeared for five consecutive seasons on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam. 
was a lead cast member in the 20 award winning Death Poetry on Broadway, released his first al album on a major label, and appeared in front of millions at the Live Aid concert. His message is life affirming and motivating. Speaking of the importance of family and the power of youth, to back up his words, he started the Hood Watch Movement organization to help inner city kids stay on the right track and understand the extent of their potential. Critics love his work and audiences respond pa passionately, and when you see him on stage, you can sense that he is very much in the zone. For Black Eyes, though, this entry into the zone comes from a sense of mission. My life has been so meaningful, I have to write something that touches faults, he said in another inter interview. I have a legacy to uphold. I grew up around great men. My father, my uncles, and my grandfather are my heroes, and, I, and just in that alone, there are some things I could never say. I could never look my father in his face knowing I have something that's playing on the radio that's absolutely a zenin. Oh my god, this is really hard, man. This is really hard, you know. You know, I really need to do it every single day. Every single day. Every That's day. absolutely asinine. Asinine, asinine. That's absolutely asinine. My voice is my gift, Black Eyes says. It's pointless if I'm not going to say anything. It's mad important. I can see in society now how important it is. Sometimes I'm discouraged, but I definitely know what I can contribute. We are who we are, but I want to get at the kids and stay in the seven and eight years old years. Telling them you are going to be something, there is no other compromise. There is no if or you might. You are going to be something. This is another secret of being in the zone, that when you are inspired, your work can be inspira inspira inspiration inspirational, inspirational to others. Being in the zone taps into your most natural self. And when you are in that place, you can contribute at a much higher level. One of the ideas we've already discussed and which we will come back to again. No point using a good idea only once is that intelligence is distinct for every individual. This is, an this is an especially important point to recognize when exploring the concept of being in the zone. Being in the zone is about using the particular kind of intelligence in an optimal way. This is what Eva Lawrence touches on when she talks about pool and ge ge geometry and geometry. It's what Monica Sells Monica Sells connect. I forgot how to pronounce this name. Monica Sellas. Monica Sellas. It's what Monica Sellas Sellas Sellas. It's what many Monica Sellas connects with when her physical is it really like that? How to really like I don't know. I would see Steffi Graf, I would see Monica Salas, and I would even see Pete Salas, Monica Salas, Monica Salas. It's what Monica Salas connects with when her physical intelligence and her mental equity become one. What Black Eyes conjures when he weaves his words born of both careful observation and a refined ear for a rhythm. Being yourself, when people are in the zone, they align naturally with a way of thinking that works best for them. I believe this is the reason that time seems to take on a new dimension when you are in the zone. It comes from a level of effortlessness that allows for such full immersion that you simply don't feel time the same way. This effortlessness has a direct relationship to thinking styles. When people use a thinking style completely natural to them, everything comes more easily. Everything comes more easily. It's obvious that different people think about the same thing in different ways. I saw a great example of this a few years ago with my daughter. Kate is very visual in her approach to the world. She's extremely bright, articulate, and well-read, but she loses interpret, interpret, inter, interpret, inter, interpret. Oh my God.
She's extremely bright, articulate, and well read, but she. Well read, well read. She's extremely bright, articulate, and well read, but she loses interest quickly during lectures of all types, not simply the ones involving the need for her to clean her room. Not long after we moved to Los Angeles from England, her history teacher began a section on the Civil War. Not being American, Kate knew little about this period in American history, and she got little out of her teacher's recitation of dates and events. This approach, filling students' heads with bullet points, had little impact on her. What a task coming up on the subject, though she couldn't simply ignore the topic. Knowing that Kate had a very strong visual intelligence, I suggested that she consider creating a mind map. Mind mapping, a technique created by Tony Buzan, allows a person to create a visual rep representation of a concept or piece of information. The primary concept sits at the center of the map, and lines, arrows, and colors connect other ideas to that concept. I had the feeling that, as someone who tends to think visually, Kate would benefit from looking at the Civil War from this perspective. A few days later, Kate and I went out to lunch, and I asked her if she had a chance to try out the mind map. As it turned out, she'd done much more than I than try it. Through this technique, she created such a strong visual representation of the Civil War in her mind that she spent the next 40 minutes telling me about the major events and the consequences of those events. By looking at it from its new perspective, one that made use of one of the primary ways in which she thinks, Kate was able to understand the way in a way, the war in a way that bullet points never would have provided. Because she produced a mind map, she was seeing the images in her mind clearly, as if she had photo photographed them. Getting out of the box. There have been various attempts to categorize thinking styles and even whole personality types so that we can understand and organize people more effectively. These categories can be more or less helpful as long as we remember that they are just a way of thinking about things and not the things themselves. These systems of personality types are often speculative and not very reliable because our personalities often refuse to sit still and tend to flutter restlessly between whatever boxes the testers devise. Anyone who has ever taken a Meyer-Briggs test knows about the various box placing tools out there. The Meyer-Briggs type indicator, MBTI, is something that human resource departments seem to enjoy using the type people. Using to type people. More than two and a half million people take the MBTI annually, and many of the companies in the Fortune 100 use it. It's essentially a personality quiz, though more sophisticated than what you might find in the pages of a pop magazine. People answer a series of questions in four basic categories, energy, attitude, perception, judgment, and orientation to live events, and their answers indicate whether there are more one thing or another in each of these categories, for example, more extroverted or in introverted. From the four categories and the two places in which people fall in these categories, the test identifies six Steen personality types, the underlying message of the test is that you and each of the other 6 billion people on the planet fit into one of these 16 boxes. There are several problems with this. One is that neither Miss Briggs nor her daughter, Miss Myers, had any qualifications in the field of psychometric testing when they designed the test. Another is that test takers often don't settle neatly into any of the categories when they take the MBTI. They tend to be just a little more to one side of the line or the other, a little more extroverted than in, in, introverted, for example, rather than being clearly one thing or the other. Most telling, though, is that many people who repeat the task end up in a different box when they do so. It's true in at least half of the cases, according to some studies. This suggests 
either that a huge percentage of the population has serious personality disorder problems or that the test might not be such a reliable indicator of type after all. My guess is that 16 personality types might be a bit of an underestimate. My personal estimate will be closer to 6 billion, though I'll need to revise that estimate in future edition of this book. Because the population keeps growing, another test is the Herman, Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. I feel a bit more relaxed about this one because it talks about cognitive preferences in terms that I believe most people would find acceptable. Like the MBTI, the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument is an assessment tool that we that uses participants' answers to a series of questions. It doesn't seek to put people in a box. Instead, it tries to show people which of four brain quadrants they tend to use more often. The A quadrant, cerebral left hemisphere, relates to analytic thinking, collecting data, understanding how things works, how things work, and so on. The B quadrant, limbic left hemisphere, relates to implementation thinking, organizing and following directions, for example. The C quadrant, limbic right hemisphere, relates to social thinking, expressing ideas, seeking personal meaning. The D quadrant, cerebral right hemisphere, relates to future thinking, looking at the big picture. Thinking in metaphors, the HBDI acknowledges that everyone is capable of using each of these thinking styles, but tries to indicate which of these styles is dominant in any individual. The function of this seems to be that people are more likely to be effective at work, at play, at any pursuit, if they understand how they approach each of these tasks. Though I'm suspicious of typing people categorically, and I still think for modes may be too few, this seems to me to be a more open approach than Meyer Briggs. There isn't saying that there is a set number of personality types, a set number of dominant ways of thinking, is that it closes doors rather than opening them. To make the element available to everyone, we need to acknowledge that each person's intelligence is distinct from the intelligence of every other person on the planet, that everyone has a unique way of getting in the zone and a unique way of finding the element. Do the math. At the age of two, Terence Tao taught himself to read by watching Sesame Street, and he tried to teach other kids to count using number blocks. Within a year, he was doing double-digit mathematical equations. Before his ninth birthday, he took the SATM, a math-specific version of the SAT, given primarily to college candidates and scored in the 99 percentile. He received his PhD at age 20, and when he was 30, he won a Fields Medal, considered the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, Anna MacArthur MacArthur Fellowship. Dr. Tao is extraordinarily gifted. He's earned the moniker the Mozart of math and his lectures, his math lectures draw standing room only crowds. His academic record suggests that he could si- he could have been successful in several disciplines, but his real calling, his discovery of the element, came via math when he was still a toddler. I remember a ch- as a child being fascinated with the patterns and puzzles of mathematical symbol mani- manipulation. He told an interviewer. I think the most important thing for developing an interest in mathematics is to have the ability and the freedom to play with mathematics, to set little challenges for oneself, to devise little games, and so on. Having good mentors was very important for me because it gave me the chance to discuss these short of mathematical recreations. The formal classroom Environment is, of course, best for learning theory and applications and for appreciating the subject as a whole, but it isn't a good place to learn how to experiment. Perhaps one character trait which does help is the ability to focus and perhaps to be a little stubborn. If I learned something in class that I only partly understood, I wasn't satisfied until I was able to work the whole thing out. It would bother me that explanation wasn't clicking together like it should. 
So I'd often spend a lot of time on very simple things until I could understand them backwards and forwards, which really helps when one then moves on to more advanced parts of the subject. I don't have any magical ability, Dr. Tao told another in interviewer. I look at the problem and it looks something like one I've already done. I think maybe the idea that worked before will work here. When nothing's working out, then I think of a small trick that makes it a little better, but still is not quite right. I play with the problems, and after a while, I figure out what's going on. If I experiment enough, I get a deeper understanding. It's not about being smart or even fast. It's like climbing a cliff. If you're very strong and quick and have a lot of rib, it helps. But you need to devise a good route to get up there. Doing calculations quickly and knowing a lot of facts are like a rock climber with strengths, with strength, quickness, and good tools. You still need a plan. That's the hard part. And you have to see the bigger picture. Terence Tao probably finds himself in the zone regularly. In addition to being born with rarer skills, he is also extremely fortunate because he arrived at his version of the element when he was very, very young. He found the place where his brilliance and his passion met, and he never looked back. What we can glean from his devotion to math and the magnet, magnet, magnetic pull it has for him has resonance for all of us. I think it's, it is significant that he discovered his passion at such a young age and could express it before he was out of diapers. I'm not certain about whether Dr. Tao is still in diapers at age two, actually. I suppose he could have been a toilet training genius as well. He could be what he was naturally inclined to be before the world put any restriction on him. We'll talk more about these restrictions later in this book. No one was going to tell Terence Tao to stop doing math because he'd make more money if he were a lawyer. In that way, he and others like him have an unencum and have an unencumber path toward the element. But they provide a path as well, for they show all of us the value of asking a vitally important question. If I If left to my own devices, if I didn't have to worry about making a living or what others thought, thought of me, what am I most drawn to doing? Terence Tall probably never had to wonder what he was going to do with his life. He probably never used the Meyer Briggs type indicator or the Herman Brain Dominance instruments to determine which career options offer a spark for him. What the rest of us need to do is to see our futures and the futures of our children our colleagues, and our community with the childlike simplicity, simplicity prodigies have when, when their talents first emerge. This is about looking into the eyes of your children of those or those you care for and rather than approaching them with a template about who they might be, trying to understand who they really are. This is what the psychologist did with Gillian Lynn and what Mick Fleet, Fleetwood's parents and Eva Lawrence's parents did with them. Left to their own devices, what are they drawn to do? What kinds of activities do they tend to engage and do they tend to engage in voluntarily? What sorts of aptitude do they suggest? Do they suggest what absorbs them most? What sort of questions do they ask, and what type of points do they make? We need to understand what puts them and us in the zone, and we need to determine what implications that has for the rest of our lives. Chapter five: Finding Your Tribe. For most people, a primary component of being in their element is connecting with other people who share their passion and is and a desire to make the most of themselves through it. Meg Ryan is the popular actor best known for her work in such movie as When Harry Met Sally and Sleepless in Seattle. Her acting career has been buoyant.
buoyant. Buoyant has been her acting career has been buoyant for more than a quarter of a century. Yet she didn't imagine a lifetime in that profession when she was at school. In fact, the whole thought, the whole thought of acting or even speaking in public, terrified her. She told me that at school performances, she had always preferred to be on the bleachers than on the stage. She was a good student, though, and in the eighth grade, she was fellow. Victorian. She was thrilled at her achievement until she realized that she had to give a speech in front of the whole school. Although she practiced for weeks, when she found herself at the podium, she simply froze in terror. She said that her mother had to go up onto the platform and bring her back down to her seat, and yet she went on to become one of the most accomplished comedy actresses on her generation. This was in part because she found her tribe. Following a successful career at school, Meg won a scholarship to New York University to study journalism. She had always loved to write, and her intention was to focus on becoming a writer, something she considered at the time to be her true passion. To help pay for tuition, those she found work in the occasional, occasional in the occasional. Commercial. This led to producers choosing her for a regular role in the soap opera, as the world turns, and to Meg's discovery that she loved traveling in the circle. I found the world of actors fascinating. She told me I was around hilarious people. The job was like being in, the, in this naughty extended family. It was a kick. I was doing sixteen-hour days, and I became more and more comfortable with the every day of it. I love the fact that we are we were always talking about why someone would do something and examining human behavior. I found I had all these opinions about what my character would or wouldn't do. I didn't know where I got them from, but I had lots and lots of them. I would say things like, "Okay, that's what the subtext is. So why am I speaking my subtext?" I would find myself rewriting lines and really engaging in the character and their world. Every day, we'd get a new script, and I had to memorize all these lines. It was absolutely overwhelmingly engaging. There was no time to think about anything else. It was complete immersion. Still, after leaving as the world turns and graduating from college, Meg did not set off immediately for Hollywood. Believing she had more to discover about herself, she spent more, some time in Europe and even considered joining the Peace Corps. But when a movie offer took her to Los Angeles, and she returned to the acting milieu, mil, milieu. she returned to the acting milieu. She found once milieu, again that she milieu, was in a rare milieu. place when doing this work. And she returned to the acting milieu. She found once again that she was in a rare place when doing this work. I met up with this really great acting teacher. Her name was Peggy Furry. Peggy started talking to me about the art and craft of acting, and what being an artist meant to her. Sean Penn was in the class above me, and Angelica Houston, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Nicholas Cage were there too. I was surrounded by people who work from really deep, deep down in themselves, and were interested in the human. Condition and the idea of bringing writing to life. All these things just started to bloom in my mind and in my heart and in my soul. So I stayed in Los Angeles and got an apartment. My agent in New York hooked me up with an LA agent, and that's when it all came together for me. Various movies have come along and taught me so many things and helped me grow as a human being. When I decided to do a movie, it may be because I think it's funny, or I want to work with a particular actor. But in the end, it always has a profound effect on my life. It's not the subject matter; it may be a particular group of people. My evolution is served by the different incarnations that are part of single every single movie. Meg Ryan could have been many things. She has genuine skill as a writer. She has considerable. Academic talents. She has a wide variety of interests and fascinations. However, when she is acting, she finds herself with a group of people who see the world the way she does. 
who allow her to feel her most natural, who affirm her talents, who inspire her, influence her, and drive her to be her best. She is close to her true self when she is among actors, directors, camera, and lighting people, and all and all of the others who populate the film world. Being a part of this tribe brings her to the element, a place to discover yourself. Tribe members can be col col collaborators. Collaborators. <clears throat> tribe members can be collaborators or com competitors. Collaborators or competitors. They can share the same vision or have utterly different ones. They can be of a similar age or from different generations. What connects a, a tribe is the common commitment to the thing they feel born to do. This can be extraordinarily liberating, especially if you've been pursuing your passion alone. Don Lipsky, one of the one of America's most acclaimed sculptors and public artists, and public artists. Always knew that he had an artistic bent. There were some early signs that he had unusual creative energy. When I was a child, he told me I was always making things. I didn't think of myself as a creative person, but as someone with nervous energy. I had to be doodling and putting things together. I didn't think of it as an asset. As an asset. If anything, it was a pecu pe pecu pe peculiarity. It was a peculiarity. It was a peculiarity. This nervous energy made him feel different from other kids and sometimes uncomfortable. As a child, he said, more than anything else, you just want to be like all the other kids. So rather than me seeing my creativity as something special, it seemed to set me apart. Through elementary school and into junior high, Lipsky was pulled in different directions. He was academically acad academically bright, but bored by academic work. Academic work came very easily to me. I would finish assignments very quickly and with the least effort rather than, than the most depth. He was gifted in math, and his school moved him into an accelerated math group. But in other respects, teachers thought of him as an underachiever because he did just enough to get by. He spent more time drawing on his books than thinking about what to write in them. When I should have been doing academic work, I was drawing or folding paper. Rather than being encouraged, I was cheated. I was cheated for it. 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 One teacher strongly encouraged his artistic talents, but Don didn't take art that seriously. The teacher became so upset with Don that he literally wouldn't speak to me. Shortly afterward, the teacher left and another art teacher arrived at the school. He brought with him a revelation for Don. They had a very rudimentary welding set up in the sculpture department, and he taught me how to weld. To me, it was like magic that I could actually take pieces of steel and weld them together. It felt like everything I had done before in art was just child's play. Welding steel and making, st wedding steel, and making steel sculptures was like real adult art. Discovering welding was like finding the holy grail. Still, he wasn't sure. What to make of this fascination? He didn't think of himself as an artist because he wasn't good at drawing. He had friends who drew well. While they were drawing, I was playing with blocks or building things out of my erector's head. None of that felt like real art. It was, it was the kids who could draw a horse that looked like a horse that felt like the real artist. Even when he began winning school art shows for his sculptures, he never thought about going to an art school. When he graduated from high school, he enrolled at the university at the University of Wisconsin as a business major. He subsequently switched his major to economics and then history, but he stayed away from the art department, even though he found little inspiration in any other classes. In his final year, he bluffed his way into taking two elect electives with working and ceramics for which he wasn't actually qualified. He loved and excelled in both. Most important most importantly, 
he felt almost for the first time the true ex exhilaration of working as an artist on his own terms. In the ceramics class, he also found something had been missing throughout his college experience, an, inspira in an inspirational an inspirational teacher. He was a very romantic and enthusiastic guy. Everything he did was like an artwork. If he was buttering his bread, he was totally into it. He served as a model for me and made me think that I could really make my life by making things. For the first time, a career as an artist seemed possible and worthwhile to Lipsky. He decided to go to graduate school at the Cranbrook Art Institute in Michigan to study ceramics. Then he hit an obstacle. His parents had encouraged his creative work as long as it was a hobby. When he applied to Cranbrook, his father, a businessman, called him in and tried to drum some economic sense into him. Don agreed studying ceramics made no practical sense, but it was all he wanted to do. His father looked at Don long and hard, saw that his mind was set, and stood the side. And when Don went to Cranbrook, he discovered a new world of people and possibilities. I'd had very little exposure to art students other than in the few courses I had taken, he said. Cranbrook is almost completely a graduate school. There were maybe 200 art students there, and about 180 of them were graduate students. So for the first time, I was around a big body of people who were very serious, knowledge knowledgeable, graduate students knowledgeable and committed to making their artwork and it was fantastic for me I went to all the critics not just in the ceramics department but in the painting department the sculpture department the waving department and everywhere just soaking it all up I spent a lot of time visiting with other students in their studios absorbing what everybody was doing I started to read the art magazines and go to museums and fully immerse myself in art for the first time. At Cranbrook, Don found his tribe, and it set him on a different path. Finding the right tribe can be essential to finding your element. On the other hand, feeling deep down that you are with the wrong one is probably a good sign that you should look somewhere else. Helen Pilcher did just that. She stopped being a scientist and became one of the world's few science comedians. She fell into it after falling out of science. In fact, falling around has been a theme for of her professional life. As she puts it, I wasn't put into science, rather I stumbled. After school, she was offered a university place to study psychology and to drink cider and watch daytime TV. After university, a generalized uh, apathy and unwillingness to find a real job led her to take a one-year master's degree in neuroscience. At this point, science itself started to get interested for Helen. There were big experiments, brain dissections, and ridiculously unflattering safety specs. Bitten by the science bug and little else, he stayed on to complete her PhD. She learned some useful science as well as how to play pool like a diva. She also learned something else. She enjoyed science, but scientists were not her tribe. In her experience, science, unlike pool, was not played on a level service. I learned that seniority in the scientific community is inversely proportional to communication skill, but directly related to the thickness of trouser corduroy. She did learn something of her craft too. I learned how to make forgetful rats remember. I made and grafted gen Janet 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 Jean Jean Ah Grafton Janet 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 Genetically Gen Genetically Genetically I made and grafted genetically modified stem cells into the brains of absent-minded rodents, which shortly after my meldings went on to develop the cognitive capacity of a London cabbie. But at the same time, my own attention began to wander. Most of all, she found that the world of science, as she experienced it, was not the utopia of free inquiry that she hoped for. It was a business. Wells, Wells, corporate science, pours cast and men hours into 
medical research, its downfall is that it's driven by business plans. Experiments are motivated less by curiosity and more by money. I felt disappointed and confined. I wanted to communicate science. I wanted to write about science. I wanted out. So she formed a one-woman escape com com committee. A one-woman escape committee. 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 Ah. Genetically, 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 genetic. Genetically. Genetically, 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 genetically. Committee. Committee, genetically. So she formed a one-woman escape committee and started digging a tunnel. She enrolled for a diploma in science communication at Birkbeck College in London. And there found like-minded friends. She was offered a degree in media fellowship and spent two wonderful months writing and producing funny science films for Einstein TV. She plucked up the courage to sell her freelance science writing to anyone who would have it. I whore, I whore, I whore my wares to radio. Wow, this is so hard, man. I hoard my wares to radio. I hoard my wares to radio, to print, and to the internet. Finally, she left the lab laborat laboratory, laboratory, laboratory. Finally, she left the laboratory, laboratory. Finally, she left the laboratory, laboratory. Finally, she left the laboratory and went to work for the Royal Society. My role was to find ways of making science groovy again, not the official job description. And then, unexpectedly, she received an email message offering her primetime stage space at the Cheltenham Sign Festival to do stand-up comedy about science. No sooner had she said yes than the panic set in. Science, as we all know, is serious stuff. Einstein's theory of relativity. Relativity. Einstein's theory of relativity does not a one-liner make. I enlisted the help of friend and fellow comedian and writer Timandra Harkness, and several pins later, the comedy research project CRP was born. She went on to join the London comedy circuit, and for the next five years, she cultures stem cells by day and audiences by night. The CRP became a live stage show where Timandra and Helen counted down the five best things in science ever. Members of the audience find themselves joining in with the formula for nitrous, nitrous oxide, volunteering to catch a scientist, recreating early experiments in flight, and singing along with Elvis about black holes. The CRP, she says, aims to prove, to prove scientifically the hypothesis that science can be funny. We are methodologically sound. During its show, a, a, control, a control audience is locked in an identical adjoining room without comedians. We then assess whether this control audience laughs more or less than the experimental audience who are exposed to jokes about science. Preliminary, preliminary data gathered from shows around the country looks promising. For Helen Pil Pilcher, a life in science has given way to a life of writing and communicating about science. Leaving the lab was scary, she says, but not as scary as the prospect of staying. My advice, should you be contemplating making that leap, is to make like a lemming and jump. Domains and fields. When I talk about tribes, I'm really talking about two distinct ideas both of which are important for anyone who is looking to find the, their element. The first is the idea of a domain and the second of a field. Domain refers to the sorts of activities and disciplines that people are engaged in. Acting, rock music, business, ballet, physics, rap, architecture, poetry, psychology, teaching, hairdressing, culture, 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 what is this? How to pronounce this? This, how to pronounce this? How to pronounce this? Couture, 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 comedy, comedy, Com comedy, athletics, pool, visual arts, and so on. 
Phil refers to the other people who are engaged in, in it. The domain that Meg Ryan discovered was acting, particularly soaps. The Phil was the other actor she worked with who loved acting the way she did and who fed Meg's creativity. Later, she moved to another part of the domains to film acting and within that and within that, from comedy to more serious roles. She extended her field as well, especially when she met Peggy Fury and the other actors in her class. Understanding Meg's domain and her connection to her field helps explain how the shy girl who couldn't give a valedictorian speech became an accomplished, world-renowned actor. When I was working, it was just me and a couple of other actors in a black room with a, with a camera team. I wasn't worried about an audience because there wasn't one. The everyday of it has no audience. The everyday of it is a black soundstage with cameras and one other person you're doing scenes with. And the activity was so absorbing. These people were so great that I just got carried away in the whole process. The confidence she got from that experience was strong enough to carry her further, further into her domain and to fresh fields of people. Even now, though, she still dislike talking in public or television talk show interviews. I do it if I have to. I just rather not. It's just not who I am. I really don't feel comfortable in that spotlight. Brian Ray is an accomplished guitar guitarist. It's a she's a guitarist. Guitarist. She's a guitarist. 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 Brian Ray is an accomplished guitarist who has worked with Smokey Robinson, Eddie James, and Peter Frampton and tour, toured on bills with the Rolling Stones and the Doobie Brothers. He came to his domain early and it ultimately led him into the inner circle of a hero that as a child he never dreamed he would meet. Brian was born in 1955 in Glendale, California the year that Alan Freed coined the term rock and roll. He was one of four kids, including a half-sister, Jean, who was 15 years his elder. Who was 15 years his elder. Jean would take me over to her girlfriend's house, and they would be playing Rick Nelson, Elvis Presley, and Jerry Lee Lewis while pouring over photos of these guys. It had such a visceral impact on me. The reactions of these Girls to this music that was pouring out of the radio and their response to these photos. There was a part of me that just got the whole thing right then and there at age three. My dad played piano and we had a little phonograph making kit. It had a microphone and you could cut a record and put this other needle on it to play the record. I remember sitting at two or three with my dad at the piano and cutting records. Right out of high school, Jen started getting into music and she joined a folk band called the New Christy Minstrels. They did a tour throughout the country. She'd tell us stories and would be glowing from it, this life she had grown into. Jen imparted to me her love and joy of music and shield that by bringing me to clubs and concerts when I was 9 and 10 years old, I would see and meet people that I worship. My brother was given a really nice Gibson guitar plus lessons. He didn't have a big desire to play music, and while he was busy not caring about the lessons, I was busy practicing on his guitar. Then I was given a $5 nylon, guitar, nylon string guitar by my sister Jean that she bought in Tijuana, Tijuana, in Tijuana. I, I just started crying. My passion for mu music was so big that it was not almost a crusade. But without my meaning to or knowing that I wanted to share it and spread it around a little. I started a band with guys before I even knew how to tune a guitar. One Sunday night when I was 10 or 11, we heard this new band on the Ed Sullivan show, The Beatles. It was such a different kind of music. It was a mixture of that black R&B that I love so much, but it was mixed with some other X factor or element that I didn't know. It was from Mars. It changed everything. I knew I wanted to play music, but now they closed the deal for me. It was just the most exciting thing I had ever seen. It made being, it made being in a band seem like something that was do doable and attractive and something I could do for a living. They took away all the maybe I'll be a fireman. I was driven now 
to what ended up being my life. In the next 20 years, Brian played with some of the most outstanding musicians of his generation. Then came the call he never expected, an invitation to audition for Paul McCartney's new band. He has been touring and playing with McCartney ever since. Never in my wildest dream would I have thought that, you know. This little blonde kid sitting Indian style in front of the TV in 1964 would end up playing with that guy singing All My Loving and I saw her standing there on the Ed Sullivan show. There is something really gratifying about this story, this, I, this you know, just being a part of the scene. The people in this book have found their element in different domains and with different fields of people. No one is limited to one domain and many people move in several. Often, breakthrough ideas come about when someone makes a connection between different ways of thinking, sometimes across different domains. As Pablo Picasso explored the limits of his blue and rose periods, he became fascinated with the collections of African art at the Musée d'Ethnographie du Trocadero in Paris. This work was vastly different from his, but it sparked a new level of creativity in him. He incorporated influences from the ceremonial masks of the Dogon tribe into his into his landmark painting that led the Moisel de Avignon and thus launched himself into the Cubist work for which he is most celebrated. As cultures and technologies evolve, new domains emerge, new fields of practitioners populate them, and an an old Domains fade away. The techniques of computer animation have generated an entire new domain of creative work in cinema, television, and advertising. These days, though, people aren't spending quite as much time as they used to illuminating manuscripts. Finding your tribe can have transformative effects on your sense of identity and purpose. This is because of Three powerful tribal dynamics, validation, inspiration, and what we'll call here the alchemy of synergy.